flow chart. And, you know, the biggest difference is, you know, I don't have all the, um, the colorful stuff on there. But just like gram-positive bacteria, we divide up our bacteria based on their shape. So we already know they're gram-negative. Then we group them by shape. We have gram-negative coccin, we have gram-negative rods or bacilli. How many bacteria that are, are gram-negative and cocci-shaped? One. So out of all the bacteria that are gram-negative and cause disease, there's only one that's cocci-shaped. Uh, which means if you look underneath the microscope, you're like, well, I gram stained the bacteria sample and it's a gram negative bacilli. What is it? <laughs> Don't know. It's one of these. There are so many bacteria that are gram negative bacilli that cause human disease. Um, gram negative bacteria, again, they have two membranes um, and they're found in lots of different places, uh, but they're harder to kill. And so gram-negative bacteria cause a lot of human diseases, and there are a lot of genus of bacteria that are gram-negative and bacilli. So if you ever see something that's gram-negative and cocci, you can right away, right away narrow it down to the genus if it's Neisseria. Now, we did our throat cultures, and you identified one of the bacteria that you saw, and some of you identified a bacteria in your throat as a Neisseria. There are normal flora bacteria that are just fine, that are Neisseria that live in your throat, um, you know, the intro PowerPoint talks about the genus of Neisseria that causes disease. So out of all the gram-negative rods, we then, because there's so many of them, start to group them in different ways. And one of them is based on their oxygen requirement. Some of these gram-negative rods are strictly anaerobic, that they would die in the presence of oxygen. Some are strictly aerobic, that they need a high source of oxygen or they die. And the majority fall into what's known as facultatively anaerobic, which means they will grow in the presence of both oxygen or no oxygen. Um, that means they can do both. And because there's so many bacteria that fall into this group for oxygen requirement, um, we further divide them down based on a test called an oxidative or an oxidase test, which we'll start doing in lab next week or two weeks. Um, and it, narrows it down a little bit more. I mean, most of them are oxidase negative, but a couple of them are oxidase positive. And we are gonna start today starting to talk about all the bacteria that fall into this group called Enterobacteriaceae. Now, because it has that beginning word called entero, where are these bacteria found? They're all digestive tract bacteria or most of them, or they're somehow tied to the digestive tract. So I want to get to where the intro recording left off. I think it's right here. So there are so many bacteria in that Enterobacteriaceae group, we still some, you know, divide them down into three groups. We call them coliforms, non-coliforms, and true pathogens. Coliforms means they can ferment lactose. And this is something we see in lab on that McConkey plate. On a McConkey plate, if those bacteria that fall into this group can ferment lactose, we would see pink colonies on a McConkey plate. And so those McConkey plates can help us narrow down if it's a coliform bacteria or not. There are lots of bacteria still in the coliform group. Um, most of them are normal microbiota, meaning normal flora bacteria that can cause disease, usually if they get somewhere else. So they're normal bacteria or normal flora that can become pathogenic if they go somewhere else. Most of the coliforms that are in this group are usually found in water sources, and that's how we pick them up. That's how they become part of our normal flora, but then that's also the, how they get transmitted to someone else. And again, they are in the Enterobacteriaceae group. These are generally digestive tract bacteria. And then we have our group that are called non-coliforms, which just means they won't ferment lactose. They would not show as pink colonies on a McConkie plate. And then we have a group called true pathogens. And so these are all going to be my next slides as we get through these three groups of Enterobacteriaceae, first starting with the coliforms. And the most common coliform bacteria that gets like all the news is E. coli. It's 
the Escherichia coli. So it's the most common of coliforms. It's super easy to identify in the McConkie plate. It's going to show that pink colony. We've been working with E. coli already. Now, E. coli is the number one cause of urinary tract infections. Again, you guys all have E. coli on your digestive tract right now. But if it gets out of your digestive tract into the urinary tract, which they're not that far away from each other, the openings, um, it's the number one cause of urinary tract infections. Strains of E. coli. Again, E. coli is E. coli. It's the genus and species, but there's more than one strain. Just like you guys are all homo sapiens, you're all humans, are you genetically identical to each other? No, but you're all still the gen same genus and species, you're all humans. E. coli is like that as well, as all the other bacteria are. Um, they're all the same genus and species, but there are different strains that are, make them genetically different from each other. And there are six types of strains that have E. coli that can cause gastroenteritis. Because E. coli gets a lot of recalls. Like, it makes the news all the time. And it's usually meat products uh, that get called for, recalled for our, an E. coli infection. So everyone thinks E. coli is bad. It's not. It's in your digestive tract doing really good things. But if something is recalled because of E. coli, it's because it is genetically one of these strains of E. coli that can cause disease. Now, the strain, because they don't get, you know, fancy names, uh, the worst strain of E. coli to get is 0157H7. And so anytime you hear E. coli getting recalled, it's because they've tested specifically for the strain 0157H7. And it's because this particular strain of E. coli produces a toxin called a shiga toxin. It's found mostly in developed countries, including ours. And it's that toxin that causes damage. That toxin prevents proteins from being formed. And you know, we need proteins everywhere. It can lead to diarrhea, hemorrhagic colitis. That's inflammation of the colon with hemorrhaging. Um, and what's something known as hemolytic uremic syndrome. It gets in and causes damage to the kidneys, which can be fatal. It's usually, from picking up undercooked beef, is usually beef is one of the top things that causes recalls for E. coli. Um, milk, juice, vegetables are all uh, other big things that cause E. coli recalls. And again, it's the specific strain of E. coli. Now, E. coli is an Enterobacteriaceae group which means it is found in the intestinal tract. It is a fecally found bacteria. And so if you ate food that has E. coli in it, what did you eat? You ate poop. Um, you eat poop all the time. It's you know sad it's to say that you guys are eating fecal matter all the time. People don't wash hands. Fecal matter is everywhere. But again, on farms, a lot of cows are carriers of E. coli in their digestive tract, sometimes even this particular strain. And guess what mm -hmm, is their poop used for on a farm. And then it's used for fertilizer. And so I'm like, it gets on different vegetables. It could get in milk if everything wasn't cleaned properly. Um, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Did you? I was like, it's bad. And I'm going to see if this link works. I feel like the La Crosse Tribune like, changed their website, and I can't always access all their stuff. Pay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it, you know, it's it's a bad strain. I was gonna say, I'm like, I, I hate that the Tribune makes me pay to read any articles these days, because um, there was a big outbreak in lacrosse. Uh, it's probably like five years ago now. Um, that was hitting daycares. Kids are dirty. Oh my God. They don't wash their hands. They just are learning how to use the bathroom. Um, they don't know how to wipe well. They don't know how to wash well. Um, kids are dirty and there was a huge outbreak of E. coli tied to daycares. And it was this strain. And it can cause individuals to be in the hospital because of that, that kidney damage. Um, it, is, it is deadly. Uh, again, it can cause internal hemorrhaging, and like it usually affects immunocompromised elderly patients even worse. Um, again, they can't always, they just don't have the immune system to even attempt to fight it off. 
So if you ever get your E. coli getting recalled, it's this particular strain. Form bacteria, I mean, it would still show up as pink colonies on your McConkie plate, is Klebsiella. And we will work with some Klebsiella in lab in a couple weeks. It is a bacteria normally found in the digestive tract as well as the respiratory tract. Um, it, it's been a while that I've had students test positive for Klebsiella because when we do the throat cultures, again, I always have students, well, you know, find a bacteria and, you know, we'll figure out what it is. Um, that I've had a couple people that have had this bacteria uh, as part of their normal flora. You know, its claim to fame on what makes it hard to kill and what allows it to cause disease is that it is a bacteria that can form a capsule. So it's harder for our immune systems to find it, recognize it, and get rid of it. Because it's part of the normal flora for a lot of individuals, it's usually only if it gets somewhere else or if you become immunocompromised that it then starts to grow and cause issues. And the number one Klebsiella that causes issues is the Klebsiella pneumoniae. And although, yes, its name has the word pneumonia in it, it can cause pneumonia, but it's not the only thing that it can cause. You know, just because it has that name doesn't mean like, oh, only causes that. Uh, it just depends on where the bacteria gets in. If it gets into the bloodstream, you have bacteremia. If it gets into the nervous system, meningitis. If it gets into a wound, a wound infection. If it gets into the urinary tract, UTI. Um, it just depends on where the bacteria gets and where it causes infections. Um, so although it has the word pneumonia, it doesn't mean that's the only thing it can cause. I think this is my last of the coliform bacteria. These, again, are the top coliform bacteria that cause disease is serratia. Interesting part is if I grow it on just a regular nutrient plate that doesn't even have red blood cells in it, um, it grows red. So this is not the plate that's growing red, that's the bacteria itself that grows a really cool red pigment, so it's very easy to identify. It doesn't generally cause a lot of issues for those that are healthy. It usually causes issues for immunocompromised patients, and it is one of the top bacteria that's linked to catheter use. Again, catheters that can stay in for a long period of time provides just an, a new environment for bacteria to get in and to grow. And it's becoming harder to treat because it's now becoming resistant to a lot of our antimicrobial drugs, to a lot of our antibiotics. I did have one more coliform. Uh, we group these three bacteria together. So they're all still coliforms. The Enterobacter, again, it's, you know, it's an Enterobacter. That's its whole species name, um, or its whole genus name, and it's found in the Enterobacteriaceae. But it's also Hafnia and Citrobacter. And we're going to work with some Citrobacter in lab in a couple weeks. Um, these are all bacteria that are normally found in soil, water, and vegetation. So these are bacteria normally found out in the environment. They're not always tied and as part of normal flora, but they can be. So they can be found in the digestive tract of both animals and humans. And there it's because they were picked up from an environmental source. Someone ate contaminated soil, water, or vegetation. Enterobacter is usually picked up by dairy products. Unpasteurized milk. Different cheeses. And these three bacteria, because we just talk about them together because they're usually found in the same places and cause the same types of things, uh, are usually tied to immunocompromised patients in healthcare settings. Most people don't suffer, most people don't suffer any type of serious issues with these bacteria, but those that are immunocompromised and you're in a hospital setting, it puts you at a risk of picking some of these different bacteria up. Now, if you're in a healthcare setting and you pick up this bacteria, you're like, well, how could I pick it up in a healthcare setting if it's normally found in soil, water, or vegetation? Well, because it is found in the digestive tract of humans, um, it's crazy how many infections are picked up in healthcare settings that are digestive bacteria, meaning fecal bacteria, meaning people in healthcare settings aren't.
cleaning themselves well, equipment isn't getting well, you know, cleaned well, and people pick up fecally found bacteria and viruses in healthcare settings. And these as well are also becoming resistant to a lot of our antibiotics. Now on to our non-coliform bacteria. So they're still in this Enterobacteriaceae group. It's a big group of bacteria. So they're all still facultatively anaerobic. They're uh, oxidase negative. But these things just don't form those pink colonies. Uh, and the most common one is Proteus mirabilis. We'll work with this guy in lab coming up too. We actually have already worked with Proteus when we put it on some of our selective plates. The unique part about it, it does a swarming motility. So we had a plate where we just put a dot of this bacteria right in the middle of the plate. And because it is very modal, it will spread out from that one dot. It doesn't stay in its little isolated colony like most bacteria do. It's very, very modal. This bacteria is also a big cause of urinary tract infections. And so E. coli is a big cause of urinary tract infection. Proteus is a big cause of urinary tract infections. Gromata McConkie plate, they'll both grow because they're both gram negatives. The biggest difference is this is non coliform and will not show us pink colonies, where E. coli is coliform and will show us pink colonies. So the McConkie really helps us narrow down what's going on. It is linked to long term urinary catheter use, puts you at a much higher risk of developing a urinary tract infection from this bacteria. And this bacteria produce an enzyme called urease. I don't have to memorize it, but we're going to be testing for urease in a few weeks in lab. Uh, but this bacteria makes the enzyme urease that will cause kidney storms, a kidney stones to form. And it's also becoming resistant to antibiotics as well. Then we get into our still Enterobacteriaceae group. So we have coliforms, non-coliforms. There's really only big one that caused uh, human disease. And then we have our true pathogens. So true pathogens meaning they have so many virulence factors, meaning you know they have lots of different things, lots of different arsenal that allow them to cause disease, that it does not matter how healthy you are, they're going to cause disease, even in the healthiest of individuals. So we call them true pathogens, because a lot of things only cause disease in immunocompromised individuals. These don't care. Healthiest individual ever, still going to cause you disease. And none of them are part of normal flora. Now, all of them that are in this group do have one virulence factor that's called a type 3 secretion system. Uh, the biggest part is here's the bacteria plasma membrane, and then here is the host cell membrane, so one of your cells, it will attach to it, and then it allows the fact that they can attach. It almost forms this little tube, so it can sit there and transmit different types of virulence factors, different types of enzymes, different types of uh, proteins into our cells to cause our cells damage. And so they can attach really easily and just literally have this little ejection system to attack our cells. Some of those things that they inject into us help inhibit phagocytosis so that they don't get eaten. Some is to rearrange the cytoskeleton of the host cells or even induce apoptosis or cell death of the host cells. So all are, you know, good for the bacteria, bad for us. And it's one of the big virulence factors that allow these bacteria to cause disease. It's good for them. Yeah, you've probably heard of this bacteria. It's probably out of all the true pathogens, this is one that probably is more, most familiar. And that's also because it gets lots of recalls, is the salmonella. So salmonella is found in the intestinal tract of birds, usually linked to chickens, but it's not the only bird, as well as reptiles and mammals. So most people associate it with chicken, with eggs. And it is. It is a top place that it's found and where we pick it up. That's just not the only place that we pick it up. So the source is animal feces on any of that meat. If the chicken wasn't cleaned, handled properly, and any of the chicken fecal matter gets on any of the actual meat as it was during that processing, um, and you ingest it and you didn't cook your meat all the way, so you cook the chicken, um, you're going to pick it up. And if you pick up salmonella, you develop salmonellosis, 
which causes diarrhea, vomiting, fever, and headache. All horrible, you know, food poisoning type symptoms. Now, there are different strains. There's different genus of salmonella and different strains of salmonella. And one strain, which is one of my next slides, uh, can cause what's known as typhoid fever. Just not that common around here. But what we're noting is the more antibiotics that are given into animals and into humans, more animals and humans are actually becoming carriers of salmonella, which then means they are transmitting it, uh, even if they're not being affected by it. And yes, we named our pet salmonella. Now, if you ate some infected meat, uh, some infected chicken, infected egg, you didn't cook it very well, um, and even if you're like, but I cooked it well, I still got it. Well, if you, cooked, if you put cooked chicken on the same meat uh, board that you were using to process it when it was not cooked, it gets on there and you eat it. But if you ingest the bacteria, way at the top you can see that little salmonella bacteria. It does have flagella all over it. And it is targeting the small intestine. Oh, we know it's the small intestine. It's got microvilli in the small intestine. And it attaches to the small intestine. It gets inside of the cells of our small intestine. And it will actually start to reproduce inside of its own little bubble. Again, it can prevent getting eaten. It can prevent phagocytosis. And so it will just grow like crazy inside these little vesicles in our cells. And ultimately, it will kill the cells of our small intestine. When the cells of our small intestine start to die, that is finally our first clue to our body that, holy cow, something's wrong, like we're under attack. And it's once that happens that we start to get all the symptoms of we have an infection. We start to get fever, cramps, and diarrhea. Again, it's our body's way. As we know there's something in the small intestine that's causing us damage, Diarrhea, it's the fastest way to get rid of anything out of the body that's in that small intestine. It's a whole lot of diarrhea. Now, it can sometimes get into the bloodstream. Luckily for us, salmonella is usually caught right away at that point uh, by the immune system, and it doesn't usually cause any type of blood infections. There's different strains of salmonella, and one of them can cause the typhoid fever. It's called Salmonella enterica serotype typhi. At least it doesn't get like an O157H7. Um, humans are the only host, so it's not coming from chickens. It's not coming from any type of animal. This particular strain is found in humans. It's found in, it affects the intestines of humans. And we pick it up by eating contaminated food or water. And because it's found in the intestines of human, and we pick it up by eating contaminated food or water, what does that mean you just ate or drank? You just ate or drank poop. Um, so you just ate or drank some fecal matter, and then we pick it up. Um, it gets, goes from the intestines. It does get into the bloodstream, uh, this particular strain. And based on its name, yes, it causes a very extreme fever that can be deadly. For us here in the United States, we do not have a lot of cases of this particular strain. And part of that is, is we know most humans pick it up because they drank contaminated water contaminated fecal water, and not just like fecal water from some animal source, fecal matter from some other human fecal matter. And luckily here in the United States, we flush the toilet, everything gets processed, um, and we're not drinking a lot of fecal matter around here. Um, other parts of the world, developing countries, you know, they don't have the type of sewer, sewer systems that we do here, and so you're more likely to pick it up if you're traveling to um, some type of developing country. And so we do have some vaccines. Um, I would say I'm like, they're not super effective, but at least you won't suffer the worst side effects if you're traveling somewhere where you know it's prevalent. But luckily for us, because we know it's found in contaminated water and we can control and treat water, the number of cases of typhoid fever has gone way down. The interesting part is the number of cases of salmonella found in chicken and birds and other mammals has actually gone up. And a lot of that is because um, of our farming practices, where we have lots of animals in you know, huge combined areas. So if one bird has it, every bird seems to have it. Um, and so we're having more cases of salmonella. 
Um, it is treatable. I mean, if you've got diarrhea, generally they say, you know, let the diarrhea pass unless it's going to cause like long-term diarrhea that you're going to become dehydrated. But diarrhea is your body's way of getting rid of the bacteria as fast as possible. So it's not always bad when you have diarrhea and you know you're infected with something to like start taking Imodium right away. It's like, get the diarrhea, you know, get that bacteria out of there as fast as possible. Just rehydrate as much as you can. Another of the true pathogens is Shigella. Also found in the digestive tract of humans. Again, it's in the Enterobacteriaceae group. And it also produces a toxin called the Shiga toxin. And this is that same toxin, that same toxin that, that E. coli 0157H7 strain makes. So same type of toxin. Stops protein synthesis. That's not good. Our cells can't make protein. And it causes severe diarrhea. I think I've got a picture. There are four strains or four species of Shigella. The interesting part is they all seem to be found in like different parts of the world. Like it seems to be very specific in where we find it. So the one we have here in the United States is Shigella sanai. Other way, uh, you can go other parts of the world if you travel and pick another species of Shigella. But they're all going to cause the same type of thing. And they're all going to affect the large intestine. They usually cause the worst damages in infants. Again, they are, you know, they put everything in their mouth. Um, and they don't have the most well-defined immune system yet. Now, how do we know it's large intestine and not small intestine? No microvilli. Um, it's also not flagellated. So this bacteria will attach to the large intestine and it will cause it to get eaten. Most bacteria don't want to be eaten. This does because it won't get broken down. So once it gets inside of our cells, it's not going to get broken down. It's not going to get eaten through phagocytosis. Um, and it will start to reproduce. It will start to spread to other cells that line our large intestine. And eventually, it will start to kill the cells of our large intestine. And once that happens, our body realizes it's under attack, lots of diarrhea. Um, again, if it gets into the bloodstream, it's usually targeted right there. Um, it usually doesn't cause any other issues other than severe diarrhea, intestinal pain, and upset. It's not fun. And then the last group of our true pathogens is the Yersinia. And there are three Yersinia species that cause human disease. There's Yersinia enterocolitica, and the Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and Yersinia pestis. Uh, Yersinia enterocolitica, its name, its whole species name itself, it means it's found in the digestive tract, specifically the colon. It's picked up by eating contaminated food or water, and it's going to cause inflammation of your digestive tract. It's going to lead to diarrhea. Lots of things lead to diarrhea. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which has nothing to do with like TB, completely different, and it causes inflammation of the intestines, which is going to lead to diarrhea. And then our last of the Yersinia, which is the one we care most about, because these lead to diarrhea. They're usually not even fatal diarrhea. It's more annoying than anything else. But the Yersinia pestis is highly virulent, which means it's super easily able to cause disease. But a unique part, it's non-enteric, which means what? Not found in the intestine, even though genetically we do group it because of similarity, so we put it into the Enterobacteriaceae group. It's the one bacteria that's not intestinally found and intestinally causing disease. And there are two diseases that Yersinia pestis can cause, the bubonic plague and the pneumonic plague. Either way, it's a plague, so it's not going to be good. Uh, it just depends on how you pick it up, depends on which plague you get, and one is more deadly than the other. So, how it's transmitted. So, this particular bact bacteria is found in uh, a lot of small rodents, whether it's mice, um, even other animals. I don't know how many times we have contact with um, little groundhogs, but, or what are they? Not groundhogs, little prairie dogs. Um, but we don't have a lot of contact with them. But if you do, you are at risk of this particular bacteria. And I want to say it was just a couple years ago, someone actually picked up this bacteria from contact with like a groundhog somewhere like in 
Montana or Wyoming. Um, super rare, because we don't see a lot of cases of this these days. Uh, but whether you're in contact with the animals themselves and pick up the bacteria, or more likely is that some insect that bites one of these animals and picks up the bacteria and then bites you, that's your more likely source of picking up the bacteria. Now, if you get bitten by one of these, you know, the animal or one of these insects, and the bacteria gets into your bloodstream, it is going to go straight to the lymph nodes. And your lymph nodes are part of your immune system, and your lymph nodes are going to swell up huge. When your lymph node swells up huge, it's called a bubo, which is where we get the name of bubonic plague. And one of the very first lymph nodes that seems to swell up the most is the lymph node right near the groin area. And so it's the first symptom that you now have the bubonic plague. There's not just picking it up through a bite and getting into the bloodstream and getting and targeting the immune system. This is a bacteria that can still get transmitted because it can still get into the respiratory tract and cause respiratory issues. And coughing can spread the bacteria as well. And if you cough and spread the bacteria and it gets into the respiratory tract, you now have the pneumonic plague, which is not as deadly. I want to say it kills like 30% of those that pick it up. Um, the bubonic plague, I'm going to you're going to have to look, but I want to say it's like 90% of those that pick it up kill it. Maybe it's not quite that high, but it's, it's pretty high um, for killing. And usually by the time you have symptoms, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. Um, it's going to kill you. So Yersinia pestis, very deadly. Again, it causes the plague. And so diagnosing it has to be rapid because it's generally going to cause you death uh, within a week of symptoms. So it's going to kill you quickly. They usually diagnose you before going to the lab and, well, let's grow it out. Let's do this, you know, and take forever. Um, right away, they're going to look at some characteristic symptoms. Um, it's treatable, but the idea is that you have to get treated as fast as possible because sometimes it's just too late um, to be treated. And we do have a lot of antibiotics that can treat it. However, you know, 200 years ago, before we had antibiotics, we didn't have anything actually to treat it. And so it became extremely deadly. Uh, now, these days, we can easily treat it. So, my little picture on where some of these bacteria can get in and cause issues. So lots of bacteria in this Enterobacteriaceae group. Again, they're generally, other than Yersinia pestis, all intestinally driven. But again, if they get somewhere else, they can still cause disease. Ah, onto our next group that's still facultatively anaerobic, which means they can still grow in both environments, um, but we got through the biggest group. Um, this group in a lab, we would sort it out by doing an oxidase test, and these two uh, bacteria genuses or gen genera are both oxidase positive, and they're in the group what's known as pasteurylaceae. These are all like amazing Scrabble words. And the first bacteria that's in our Pasteurellaceae group, that's the genus Pasteurella, is Pasteurella multicida. And this bacteria is normally found in the mouths and noses of animals, and not just farm animals or wild animals. These are commonly found in the mouths and animals of our pets. So if you get bitten by your cat or bitten by your dog, um, usually healthy immune systems can right away recognize that infection and get rid of it, but people that are immunocompromised or if there's a high enough number of bacteria, it can cause infection. So if you get bitten by your pet and all of a sudden you get an infection, it could be this bacteria. This causes localized inflammation. Again, worst complications are those that are immunocompromised. Bacteria in the Pasteurella group, and even in our next bacteria as well, these are picky eater bacteria, which means to grow them up, they require their red blood cells to be broken down for them. And so to grow them up, we have to put them on chocolate blood augers. They're the picky eaters. They're called fastidious. They're picky eaters. We do have lots of antibiotics that can treat it. 
And so if you get it bitten by an animal or know someone that's gotten by, bitten by an animal and it looks like an infection is taking place and it's just really not going away as fast as it should be, you can go in. They're probably not even going to run tests on it. They're probably just going to give you some antibiotics. They may run tests if it still isn't going away very quick, you know, even with antibiotics. Now, my way to remember that Pasteurella multisida is found in animals. You know, animals live in pastures even if it's not always just farm animals. Our next genus that's found in this Pasteurellaceae group, um, it doesn't get that nice genus of Pasteurella, it's the Haemophilus influenza. And its claim to fame is that it has a capsule or it can make capsules. And again, lots of strains of Haemophilus influenza that can cause disease but the worst strain of Haemophilus influenza was called Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenza type B. It was a very deadly strain. It caused deadly meningitis and epiglottitis. That's your epiglottis that causes it to inflame that you could actually suffocate. Very deadly bacteria in the past. And the reason why we have very few deaths, I don't even know the last time I've heard of one, I would think it would make the news, um, is because we have a very effective vaccine called the Hib vaccine. So if you ever wonder what the Hib stood for, it's Haemophilus influenza type B. And so because we vaccinate youth now, and because this vaccine is very effective, we have very few cases of meningitis or epiglottitis. However, there are multiple strains of Haemophilus influenza. There's not just type B. There are different strains of Haemophilus influenza, and this bacteria can still cause bronchitis. It can still cause um, the infections in the respiratory tract and still cause ear infections. It can still cause sinus infections. It's just it's not going to cause deadly meningitis. So we still have Haemophilus influenza out there. We generally just don't have that type B strain anymore causing deadly infections. Um, a unique thing about this bacteria as well, other than it can make a capsule, is that it is pleomorphic. And so it is gram-negative, it is bacilli-shaped, but a lot of times we see long rods and short rods and some that almost look circular. Um, it is pleomorphic, so it can vary up in its shape. And then the last of our pastoral ACA, last of our oxidative, um, facultatively oxidative, oxidative is homophilus. Um, Ducrii. It's one of the few we talk about that's a sexually transmitted bacteria. And this bacteria causes genital ulcers in males. They're usually asymptomatic. But why is that bad? You would have no idea that you're a carrier of this bacteria, which means you could be spreading it um, without having any idea. So it's like, ah, oh, yay, women, yay, we don't suffer at all. You could be transmitting it, um, and I don't think males are going to enjoy that. Very common. I mean, there's other bacteria that are more common diseases, bacteria-wise, that are sexually transmitted. As I say, in the intro, one of the Neisseria was the Neisseria gonorrhea. Gonorrhea. We're finally on to a different oxygen requirement, on to our aerobic, our strictly aerobic bacteria. Um, Brucella, Bordetella, Pseudomonas, Francisella, and Legionella. Do any of those sound familiar? I was going to say, sometimes it's the only one people are like, oh, no Bordetella. You may, you're like, I've never heard of Bordetella. You've probably heard of the species, maybe not the genus, and you've probably definitely heard of the disease that Bordetella causes. But we'll get there. Like two slides. Uh, so our first one, Brucella, it's a non-modal coxobacilli. So it is a very short rod. And although there are lots of Brucella species out there that can cause issues, there's only one that causes issues in humans. That's the only one we care about. And it's the Brucella melatonensis. Now, if you pick up this particular bacteria... You now have a disease called brucellosis. Um, for some, asymptomatic. You would have no idea that you even picked it up or a very mild disease, kind of a mild, oh, I'm kind of feeling achy, tired. A unique thing with this bacteria, it causes what's known as a fluctuating fever. 
which means one hour you could have a fever of 101, the next hour it's back down to normal, the next hour it's 104, and then all of a sudden it's down to like 99, and then it will, it varies. Usually if you have a bacterial infection, you just have a high fever and it stays high. This bacteria causes our immune system to kind of react to it differently. It's usually tied to dairy, to dairy cattle. So the high, I was gonna say, not the number, but one of the highest groups of individuals that pick up this particular bacteria are dairy farm workers. There's not a lot of cases though. This is not super prevalent. I know we're in like the dairy state. It's not super prevalent though. The unique part about it, it's easily spread if you work with it. And so people that work in the lab, you know, that identify all these different diseases that people come into the hospital for, they have to be very careful. They don't always know what they're working with. Um, it's the number one lab acquired infection that a lot of lab workers pick it up when they're identifying people that are positive. So 24% of all the cases um, of lab workers picking something up, pick this up. And it is deadly. Um, I want to say it was probably been like 10 years now, but someone just in the Gunderson Lutheran lab picked this up and died of it. So it's not super common, um, but it is something that, yes, if you're working with the lab identifying all these random things, you don't always know what they are. Um, and if you're not careful, it can be deadly. Exxon modal also cocci bacilli, so it's a little short rod. Um, the most common Bordetella that causes diseases in humans is Bordetella pertussis. You're like, ah. Oh. Uh, and Bordetella pertussis disease, pertussis, are more commonly known as whooping cough. You know, my head's up. We're getting into the fall season where, you know, I'm hearing everything on the news these days of everything that's starting, you know, you know, get vaccinated for this. And, you know, I'm like the flus and pertussis and um, respiratory syncytial virus. I just had a student in one of my other classes. Her, um, she's got two kids now that have just been diagnosed with the respiratory syncytial virus. It's like crazy, going crazy this year. But pertussis, luckily, is something we can vaccinate for. Uh, but infants are at the highest risk of one picking it up and suffering the worst side effects of it. Again, they don't have the strongest immune systems. Now, this bacteria does have adhesions that allow it to stick to the respiratory tract. These are those little cilia found in the respiratory tract. And not only is it going to stick to the respiratory tract, it's going to produce toxins to then damage your respiratory tract. Obviously, we need our respiratory system for breathing. And so if we start killing cells with toxins, it's not good. And one of the symptoms, anytime you have any kind of damage to your respiratory tract, just like diarrhea, your body wants to get rid of it as much as possible, it coughs to try to like get rid of the bacteria, just like the diarrhea gets rid of things out of the digestive tract. But that's how it's now spread. So the symptom is then now how it spreads. So it's spread through aerosols that you breathe and cough up that bacteria and someone else breathes it and now gets it into their respiratory tract. Now, the time course for pertussis or whooping cough is unique all in itself with a bacterial infection. Most people, they get a bacterial infection within 24 to 48 hours, you're already starting to see symptoms. Oh, you maybe take some antibiotics and then like, you know, 48 hours later, you're feeling better. The time course for this disease is in weeks, not days. And so if someone coughs on someone, we'll say someone was infected and coughed on an infant, first week and a half, no idea anything's going on. The bacteria is in there, it's sticking, it's starting to grow. A week and a half after that, you get into what's known as the catarrhal phase, rhinorrhea, which means runny nose, coughing, malaise, you're tired, and a fever. At this point, what do you probably think you have? Flu. More of the cold. I mean, you got a runny nose, you're just like, oh, I don't know, I'm feeling under the weather. No big deal. And you've got that for like a week and a half. But then it gets into what's known as that paroxysmal phase, because it's at this point you have caused a ton of damage to the lungs and your respiratory tract is now starting to kick in and realize this. And you start to get into this coughing because of that damage to the respiratory tract. And it's repetitive coughing with whoops. And I'll see if I've got my audio work. Um, that the whooping is really gasping for breath with every cough because there's so much damage to the respiratory tract 
that oxygen exchange can't happen fast enough to supply enough oxygen. So they're gasping for breath. Um, it can cause vomiting because they are coughing so hard and so long and just full on exhaustion. You can't eat if you're coughing this hard. You can't sleep if you're coughing this hard. This is not just like, oh, I'll take some NyQuil, you know, and knock myself out. Like, there's just nonstop coughing. The individuals die of full-on exhaustion. They're not eating. They're not sleeping. And that goes on for weeks. Like, I can't even imagine having an infant, you know, and they're sick for 24 hours and you freak out. But weeks of this nonstop coughing and gasping for breath. And even then... When they start to, you know, finally turn it around a little bit, it's still weeks that you're still going to have a residual cough. Now, diagnosing it, I'm going to see if my little audio works. I don't know with this room. Good. Um, and again, they're not just doing that for a day. It's like weeks that they're gasping and coughing like that. Now, diagnosing it, that symptom, that gasping with every cough, that's a unique symptom. Most people cough and don't gasp afterward. But to actually confirm a diagnosis, they do a nasopharyngeal sample. I mean, we're talking this is like the COVID, but even worse, they go back even farther. I've got a picture that shows it. Oops. Yes. Oh. You thought like a COVID test was bad. Like they go all the way back as far as they possibly can to get that nasopharyngeal sample. They're just not going inside the nasal. They're like going to the very, very back of the whole nasal passageway because that's where that uh, enough bacteria like to hang out. And if we're going to test for it, we want to make sure we get a good culture. Luckily, it's a very skinny um, little swab that goes back there. Otherwise, they can grow it out in a lab. Um, they can do fluorescent antibody tests. We can do DNA tests. Um, but treatment is unique. By the time you are showing symptoms, go back if I can. By the time you are showing symptoms, like weeks, like weeks later, if you notice, the bacteria at this point are already starting to die. So at this point, giving you antibiotics can help get rid of some of the bacteria. But it's at this point, we don't even care about the bacteria. What the bacteria have done to the respiratory tract has already happened. They've already destroyed the respiratory tract. So antibiotics are not going to help the patient. They will help kill the bacteria so they can't spread it. But antibiotics will not help the patient at this point. Nope. And so treatment is generally supportive. It's making sure they probably are going to be on some type of oxygen supply. They're probably going to be on steroids to help open up airways as well as possible. They're going to try to make them as comfortable as possible, so hopefully they can get some sleep and recover. But treatment for someone with pertussis is generally supportive. Damage is done. They'll give them antibiotics, because obviously we don't want to spread it, but it's not going to help the person. Luckily, it's preventable. We have a vaccine. This is pertussis, so it is the P of the DTAP or the P of the TDAP. Difference, if you notice in the DTAP versus the TDAP, one is a capital letter P, one is a lowercase letter P. Um, the A before it's not there just to make a word, it just means acellular, um, which means it's a broken up uh, cell that's put in part of the vaccine. Uh, the capital P generally is the very first vaccine given. It's the capital P is like it's going to elicit the stronger response. Anything that has the lowercase b is a usually lower dose, um, and it's generally for boosters. So if you ever see, like, oh, why is capital sometimes and lowercase other times? However, if you notice, the number of pertussis, you know, went way down. Great vaccine. Now it's going way up. Why? What? Anti-vaxxers. People are not vaccinated anymore. Um, it's, not on camp, it's not uncommon now because it is so deadly, especially for infants, um, that I've know, I'm knowing more and more people, because there are so many anti-vaxxers out there, I'm knowing more and more people that when they have their children, they'll be like, they will literally say, show me your vaccine before you come visit. Um, before you even hold my baby, show me that you've been vaccinated. 
um, because it's deadly. Like, no one wants to go see a baby and then realize they killed them because they coughed on them. Um, and so it's becoming more prevalent because so few people, not so few, but there's less and less people getting vaccinated, um, that it's becoming more of, okay, as the mom's responsibility to make sure that their kid is not exposed to it. Any clicking. All right, another aerobic gram negative raw, that was my GNR. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, found in soil and organic matter. I put the little note on there, it is oxidase positive. And so the oxidase test really helps us sort out those facultatively anaerobic bacteria. But that doesn't mean the only two that were in your little flow chart that are oxidase positive are just that Pasteurella and Haemophilus. This one's oxidase positive as well because we're going to work with this one up in our lab in a couple weeks. Um, it's not part of the normal flora. It's usually linked to hospital settings that people pick it up while in hospital settings. And there's really two big groups of individuals that usually suffer the worst for this bacteria. And it's individuals that have cystic fibrosis and burn victims. And it's because this bacteria loves a very moist, warm environment. And people that have cystic fibrosis have a lot of mucus in their lungs. And that additional mucus in their lungs provides that nice, moist environment. People that have third degree burn victims, you've literally lost that first line of defense and your fluid from your body and your tissues is right there at the surface and it's right there causing infections. Now this bacteria, when it does grow, does produce a greenish color and you may see that in lab as well. Um, so we can see this burn victim, you could actually see that greenish color uh, right through the bandages showing that this is an infection. It's not the only people. I've known people that have gotten ear infections and sinus infections from this bacteria, but it's not anything deadly, but it is deadly for those that have cystic fibrosis and third degree burns, and it's getting harder to treat, as most bacteria are. And because it is picked up by burn victims and pseudomonas, or cystic fibrosis patients, it does get into our little group of top causes of nosocomial or healthcare infections um, in the United States. So I think I had this in my intro. Um, out of all the gram-negative bacteria that cause a lot of our healthcare-associated infections, almost all of them are the Enterobacteriaceae group, meaning fecal-driven bacteria, except this one. It's not fecal-driven, um, but it is still a ca top cause of healthcare-associated infections. The next aerobic gram-negative rod is Francisella tularensis. It's an intracellular parasite. And it likes to hang out in lots of different small animals. The most common one around here that we can find it in are rabbits. It's found in muskrats, and it's found in some ticks. So if you have contact with rabbits, I don't know how many people have contact with wild rabbits, um, muskrats, I don't know if anyone that has contact with muskrats, um, but different, like, you know, DNR might, um, or ticks. Luckily, the tick species that it's found in is not found around here. It's more out, like, Colorado-ish area. But if you get bitten or handle any of these infected animals, um, you get a condition known as tularemia, um, and it's extremely infectious. Most bacteria, you need to get like a few thousand in your body before there's even a chance that it would cause disease. You just need 10 of these in the body, and it's going to cause disease. Like just 10, 10 tiny little microscopic bacteria, and it will cause disease. And if untreated, it is very fatal. Luckily for people that we know are working, I don't know whether they are breeding rabbits or whatever, if you are an at-risk individual, we do have a vaccine. A lot of times, it's more commonly known as rabbit fever, because it does cause an extreme fever. Because it has such a low dose that it causes infection, and because it can be deadly, it actually is our list. We have this in our lab somewhere. I can't find it, though. Um, this poster, it, it is in our list of like top bacteria for agents of bioterrorism. Um, other ones that up there, Bacillus anthracis, which is a gram-positive, that Brucella bacteria that causes a, a, a number of lab infections, and the Yersinia pestis, the plague. But this one is up there, too. It doesn't cause a lot of diseases out in nature that I hear of um, because it's so infectious and deadly. Agent of bioterrorism. 
Our next aerobic gram negative rod, I think this is my last aerobic. Um, I might have to record the last two bacteria, um, is Legionella pneumophila. It is pleomorphic, which means it can vary in its shape. And it is always tied to a water source. And it doesn't mean you drink the water to pick it up. You could. But you can inhale it as well. So you can have this bacteria, um, and you can get it because if it's in your infected water and you shower and it's in the water. If it's in the hot tub, I mean, warm, moist environment is a hot tub breeding ground for bacteria. Even grocery store misters have been known to carry this particular bacteria. So if you walk by, you know, the misters like in festival, and you're like, oh, they're misting my food. Don't breathe it in. You never know. You can be put at risk. This bacteria causes what's known as Legionnaire's disease, fever, chills, pneumonia, diarrhea. It is fatal for immunocompromised and elderly individuals. Usually, people, uh, usually if there's a Legionella um, infection, it's usually an outbreak. It's usually because there is a water source somewhere that has this bacteria. So there's almost never just one person that ever gets Legionella. It's usually a large group of individuals. The last case that I've heard of around here um, was three years ago in the Dells. One of the hotels in the Dells had this in their water source. Um, I don't remember what the number of people, but quite a few people actually picked up this particular bacteria from there. Um, it's called Legionnaires and got its name because it actually used to affect quite a few large of military. Um, that were in large groups, shared water, um, and picked it up. That's just where it got its random name. But it is deadly. It has caused quite a few deaths. Um, I don't remember what the percentage of people it is that get it, but elderly and um, immunocompromised, it's deadly. I will record the last two. Almost got there. There's just two little anaerobic bacteria species that can cause disease. So things to do before I see you on Monday is watch my last little recording of our two anaerobic uh, bacteria. It shouldn't be a very long recording. Uh, and then there will be an online quiz due Sunday night by midnight. There isn't any intro video for the next PowerPoint because, again, we got through gram-positive bacteria. We are getting, got through this gram-negative bacteria. Our last PowerPoint for bacteria, we call them as our unusual bacteria. They behave unusually or they have unusual shape like those spirillum bacteria. Um, but I should be able to get through all of those on Monday without having any intro video. So just watch the last little snippet and take a quiz before I see you on Monday. Otherwise, enjoy the beautiful weather.